Welcome back, everyone, from a, a pretty beautiful uh, Tuesday morning here. But this is our last class, our last session uh, for the semester. And it's um, the culminating topic, which is uh, environment, the environment, so ecological practices. Uh, truth be told, I'd love to teach uh, just the whole class just on ecological practices and art and activism. It would be an amazing class. And I have to admit, this was a difficult one to prepare, only in the sense that I have just way too much material, uh, way too many examples I could have given you. Um, so it's a little difficult, I feel like, no matter what I've done, it's just it's coming up short to give you the full picture of what ecological practices are like, but hopefully that's only in my own mind, and that this is just a nice primer and introduction to, to the theme and to maybe the most important topic that, that, we, could, that we could talk about, and definitely one of the most important topics. So the environment and ecological art practices. Let's begin with just a few, a couple concepts before we get to, to, to the works themselves, which are important. So one is um, knowing what geological epoch uh, we actually live in. And this for a long time, for the whole history of our species, was not really an issue. Um, the geo geological epoch that we've been in um, for the past a little less than 12,000 years um, is the Holocene. And this encompasses the whole history of the growth uh, of, of our species, of our hominization. Um, uh, basically represents all of human civilization, which is quite incredible at the timeline of our planet, which is 4.4 billion years old. And then, you know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. So if you're interested in these incredible time scales, which are hard to get your mind around, are uh, these non-human time scales. Uh, the Cosmos series is quite good. Um, either the original with with Carl Sagan or uh, the, the the newer one with uh, Neil Tyson deGrasse, which the, the the graphics are incredible, and I think it's on Netflix. So when we were talking about when our species have have proliferated and have done all the things we've done. We're talking about the most recent epoch, and the epoch, geologists like to talk in really big terms, the epoch um, um, is the smallest measure of unit in, in, in geology. So this is relatively short, and this has been the Holocene. And the reason why we've been able to do the things we have, develop these civilizations, and then ultimate, ultimately these technologies and these newer technologies, is because of relative climate stability. There's a, there's a sweet spot for, in which our, our, our type of life forms, which are the only ones we know, we know of, um, can actually uh, live, can actually thrive. And the Holocene provided just that. So it's a period of relative climate stability. So what ha what's happened in the past couple decades now are geologists, but not just geologists, philosophers and artists, and other thinkers, they've posited that actually we've entered into a new epoch, a new geological epoch, which some have called the Anthropocene. Others uh, are critical of this term. Um, we might talk about this when we when we talk about the works. Uh, so there are some some terms like the 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 Capitalocene. So the epoch that's that's ruled by by the the, the, the power. Um, of capitalism, rather than Anthropocene, which implicates all of humankind. Anthro is, is human, um, and that's where we get the term Anthropocene. And it was coined by a Dutch atmospheric chemist, his name was Paul J. Crutzen, who evidently just in, the, in a conference, like off the cuff, yelled out when someone was talking about the Holocene. He said, no, we're not in the Holocene anymore, we're in the Anthropocene. And he went, what he meant by this is that for the first time in the history of, the, of this planet, of planet Earth, Humans have become a factor, a force, on a geological scale. So before this, whatever we did at civilizations, it didn't really have global impact. It didn't really have an effect on the planet as a whole. The planet was doing its thing, right, if we're going to anthropomorphize the planet. But there's an argument to be made that at some point in the history of, of our species, we did become a factor on a, on a global scale, on a planetary scale. 
So there are a number of competing. This is really fascinating. I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole because I've I've done a lot of I've done a lot of reading about this, but I'll just give you a few examples. So around 1610, uh, 1610 is around the time where on this continent um, there was an errat a genocidal eradication of uh, of indigenous peoples of, of First Nations. Right? And so what happened is all the agriculture that that they they were uh, that they were doing um, reforested, rewilded because of this genocide. And through the geological record, scientists are able to see that this produced an incredible amount of carbon sequestration. So all this carbon that had been in the air all the way back these centuries ago, because a whole continent, almost a whole continent, got reforested, rewilded, um, the, 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 the trees, the vegetation, the, the plants, took in this extra carbon. So we actually see it on the record. So it's possible, some people say that this Anthropocene begins then. Some people have it way further back. They say it begins in the Neolithic period when we already when we started domesticating uh, nature, especially animals, which we'll talk about quite a bit today. But most people will, will place the Anthropocene um, safely in the 20th century. So in 1945, the idea that we could create a weapon that could destroy um, all life on Earth. I mean, if that doesn't qualify for a, a geological force, um, I don't know what does. Um, and then, of course, the Industrial Revolution, beginning in the 19th century and then accel accelerating throughout the 20th century, which has released uh, greenhouse gases um, through fossil, the burning of fossil fuels, which has created this greenhouse effect, which if you don't know what that is, definitely just uh, read up a little bit about climate science because it's important to know these things. Um, these gases, these greenhouse gases, mainly uh, carbon dioxide and methane, um, are now, there, there are more uh, uh, cubic units of it in the atmosphere now that it's trapping heat coming in from our sun, this nuclear reactor uh, a million, mi million miles away. Um, it's trapping the heat um, more and more um, and changing the thermal composition of our planet. Um, and so this would be the first time that it's actually human activity doing this, because of course this has happened before within the history of the planet, but this is the first time where we are actually doing it. And so this relative stability of the Holocene has given way to this much more um, unstable, and at least for our well-being, and the well-being of so many other species um, on this planet, it's become an unsettling um, and in some places unlivable. And so this is the really scary thing about climate change and climate politics, is that within probably, not probably, it's very likely that within our lifetimes we're going to see the displacement of millions of peoples. Um, we're already entering into, we've already entered into the sixth mass extinction um, of, of, of all these species that are dying off um, and, and water rising. Um, and places that that are either will, will either be too hot to inhabit for for humans, or too wet. Um, you know, the, the, that, that water will have taken over islands and um, coastal geographies throughout the world. So this is really scary stuff, and this is one reason why this is one of the most important things we could talk about and be engaged in and be active with. So a lot of the artists that we talk about today will be engaged and active um, um, on this topic. So that's just the primer on climate politics, climate science, um, and this new age that we've possibly entered into where we are now, um, um, truth be told, ca causing all this harm um, on a geological scale in, in a way that has never been possible before in the history of, of, this, of this planet. So what's the roadmap for today's class on the topic of art and ecology now that we've sort of um, established that, that big picture? The first thing we're going to do, and I do, I go all too quickly here, so please don't think that environmental practices or ecological practices in art begin in the past couple decades. Um, definitely beginning in the 1960s and the 70s. This is the heyday of the beginnings of the modern environmental movement. Um, you have this big, the first big UN Stockholm conference in 1972, where all these countries get together and start, talk, start, start talking about environmental issues. You have someone like Rachel Carson writing um, Silent Spring in 1962 about pesticides, 
um, in large-scale agriculture and its polluting effects and killing off of birds and, 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 and all this environmental devastation. We're definitely going to talk about animal agriculture and its devastating impacts today um, in today's class because that's really important to know about. So there are a number of precedents in the 60s and 70s, including artworks and artists. So please, I'm only, going, I'm only giving you like four or five examples, but there's a lot there um, to tap into. Um, so we're going to do that first. Then we're going we're gonna to basically talk about much more contemporary practices and in three, three different uh, sections. So this is almost like a taxonomy of ecologically based practices. So the first, the first type is artists that represent environmental issues. So they mediate something. Um, they mediate a situation, which in the best case scenario, this can be like a consciousness uh, uh, raising sort of gesture, right? Photographs that show you the full horror of something, right? So um, a politics of representation um, at the level of the environment. Then we have artists that try, they go maybe a step further, or maybe not a step further, but a different tactic than simply representing the issue. They actually try to uh, induce a certain affect in you when you're in the gallery, when you're experiencing a work of art that has to do with an environmental issue. So you're no longer removed from the image, you're no longer removed from the mediation of the environmental issue, from its representation uh, in a painting or in a video or in a, um, in a photograph or a text, but you're actually experiencing it um, in real time with your body, with your nose, with your eyes, um, with your ears, and so on and so forth. So um, in this case, we'll be talking a little bit about olfactory um, um, artists, um, artists that work with, with smell, um, which I've done a little bit of work on, and it makes a lot of sense for these type of artists to be working on ecological issues. And then to, to, to round out our discussion, we talk about artists who are almost more like activists. So uh, they've actually left the gallery altogether in most cases, um, and they're directly engaged with environmental issues, with protest, um, and with facilitating um, a reconception of the world, one, one we, desperately, we desperately need. So this is our roadmap for today. So let's begin uh, with some canonical earlier works, um, like Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. And if, there's, if there was an artist who was interested uh, a moment ago, I talked about time on a non-human scale, right? These time scales that we can't even wrap our minds around. Robert Smith and Smithson was all about this. He, he really was fascinated with time on a scale that went beyond um, human time scales, which would be, you know, uh, hours, minutes, seconds, and then lifetimes that are, you know, hopefully 80, 90, 100 years old, right? Um, so he was interested in, in geological time scales, planetary time scales. And you probably know this work because it's so famous. Um, I even show it in my intro class um, and we talk about it. This is a spiral jetty, which is in Utah. It's one of these really celebrated land, uh, land artworks um, or earthworks. There are a number of different names for it, which start happening in the very late 60s into the 70s. And Robert Smithson is the, one of the key practitioners of, of earthworks or earth art, land art. Um, and this is a human figure right here. Uh, this is, I don't know when this photograph was taken, it's just one of the more beautiful um, images of, of his spiral jetty. Um, but, but he did it originally in 1970, and this is the scale, this is a person, there's another one here. And he did it with, with bulldozers and, and, and machines, and this is all land that he's taken out into the Great Salt Lake and created this spiral. So it's a very rich work. We don't have time to really go into it. Um, if you take my post-war class, my 1945, uh, my post-1945 class, we talk about Spiral Jetty at length. I, I only bring this up as this canonical earthwork that, that artists are going out into nature using the environment, using um, um, the earth as material. And in Smithson's case, he's actually, he is interested in environmental issues. Um, but there is a way in which some of these early earthworks are simply um, um, tapping into like a much older conception of, of humans as sort of working with the land, working with the earth as a way to sort of uh, organize it for its own ends. Um, so in this case, 
I mean, this is this is a reductive understanding of the spiral jetty, but that it's this massive thing that that one person, one artist can do, almost tame the land and make the, make it into the shape he or she wants, right? Uh, so there's a certain amount of mastery and large scaleness to these earthworks, to this land art, which may not be um, to our eyes, anyways, to, to our moment now, like the most eco ecologically sound in the sense that um, today, when we think ecologically, we think of of, um, of um, relinquishing some of this mastery, um, this overmastery that we've had on our planet um, and the earth. So that might be a slight little critique of Smithson and these large-scale earthwork artists. And so we could then bring in a, another artist working around the same time, Andy Goldsworthy, who does similar work out in nature. He'll go in and, and reconfigure nature, use natural elements, um, to create patterns, often very beautiful, delicate, fragile patterns, but he is not, uh, let's say, dominating the, the landscape like some of these er, er, bigger earthworks, more monumental earthwork artists were. Um, he's going in in very, almost non-invasive ways, using what what the landscape provides him, and then makes these 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 works that are totally ephemeral. Like this is this is this Japanese maple. It's such a beautiful work. He uses these maple leaves to create this pattern with a whole on frozen glass, uh, or partially frozen glass. Uh, this is not going to last more than a day, right? Or the work that is in, in, is in the reading that I gave you, the, the Smith chapter, that ice, it's gorgeous, that, that little ice spiral that he, that he, 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 um, he melts and forms and then places, um, uh, and then is, is wraps around the tree. That's not going to last, right? This is a very ephemeral, a much more gentle conception of, uh, of, of an earthwork. So already here with Goldsworth, we might be moving away from this paradigm of, of large-scale, sort of uh, maybe more aggressive, invasive uh, um, earthworks towards something, let's say, m with a smaller footprint. And this idea of footprint, whether it's a visual footprint or a carbon footprint um, or, a, or a literal footprint, it's going to be, this, it seems to be one of the themes of climate discourse and even of some of the works that we look at today. Then we have some very precocious artists like Hans Hacke, who didn't, who didn't go into nature to use it as a medium, right? In some ways, Goldsworthy and, and uh, Smithson, this is old school, right? This is still a conception. It's new in the sense that they're working with nature itself, but it's old school in the sense that they're using it for formal, um, for something formal, for something beautiful, um, as a medium, right? Hans Hacke is not so much interested in, in, in traditional medium uh, media. Uh, he's much more interested in these systems that can tell us something about the natural world and about our world and about our, um, our, our, um, our effects on it. So this is a really well-known work that he did in 1972 called Rhinewater Purification Plant. And you have water that's coming from a very polluted river nearby, this is in Germany, and it's going in and being filtered into this large-scale, uh, more or less, aquarium here. Um, and it's been unpolluted. And you know this, of course, because these fish are swimming in the water. Um, and while they're contained and confined, um, and can't, you know, can't, can't, can't travel along their normal patterns, the migratory patterns in a water in a river, for instance, or, or a lake, um, at the very least, they seem to be thriving. They seem to be um, uh, able to, to, to breathe in the water because it's unpolluted. So this is a work that's much more almost like a, a laboratory science experiment work that thematizes pollution uh, and thematizes the way life needs unpolluted areas. So whether it's fish in water or us in the city, um, um, just going on about our daily lives. I mean, it's, 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 it's tragic that um, one of the things that's made this pandemic worse, scientists are finding out, is actually the more polluted an area is, the more likely people will, um, will, will get sick. The, the, the virus, the coronavirus, is, is, um, spreads more easily the more polluted um, a city is. Um, so this idea of pollution is, is becoming a, a theme front and center for a work of art like this. Not represented so much, but actually he's, he's done it. On a small scale, he's purified this water, but on a very small scale, so it's a, it's an incisive work. Then you have someone like Alan Sonfist um, in our city, um, which once everything opens up, go see it. This is in the West Village, 
Um, this is his time landscape, which he started in 1965, and it's ongoing. And it's ongoing because it's a type of work where he just he bought this plot, and he said the the, the plot should just be left to its own devices. It, this is this is a, a little plot in New York City where it's zoned in such a way that no one can do anything. So you just let the trees, you let the vegetation, whatever small little ecosystem you have at the level of fauna, insects and birds, and whatever else, they are there and they, they're gonna do what they're gonna do, right? So Sanfis, this is like a, a literal rewilding of the urban landscape. So a fascinating work. And at the end of today's lecture, we're gonna talk about artists that are working in this mold that, um, that quite literally are either rewilding or working with plants as a way of, of, of meeting some of the climate, solution, climate solutions that we desperately need. Uh, plants are important for so many reasons, one of which would be carbon sequestration, but also plants are the, the, by far the best thing for, for human health, right? Uh, for nutrition, for health, and so on and so forth. So a lot of artists are working with um, um, making gardens, some that are edible, and others that are simply there as a form of rewilding as trees, sequestering and helping us breathe, having less polluted urban landscape. And on that on that tip, we also have then Joseph Bo Joseph Boys, this very canonical work of his called Seven Thousand Oaks that he he did in 1980, um, um, and it's a project of the, 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 the it's it's more a little more complicated than this, but basically it's an artwork that, that the ambition is to plant seven thousand oaks. Um, so Joseph Boys is one of these foundational figures of ecological art, not only in the work where he actually goes in and tries to make the environment better, uh, but he was actually one of the first organizers of the Green Party in Germany, which is still, uh, which is still going strong. And we def uh, uh, this might be my own little bias, but many of you will probably agree, we desperately need a, a, a strong, um, powerful Green Party in this country. And there's no question about it. At least in my mind. So, boys is interesting for a number of a number of reasons. So now let's move up to the to the present. So those were some canonical um, historical works from the 60s, 70s, and very early 80s. Now let's get to some let's get to some works that are much more recent. So we have someone like Daniel Beltra, <clears throat> a photographer, um, who worked with Greenpeace. A lot of time, these artists are going to work with environmental organizations. Greenpeace is one of the one of the older, more famous ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. This was um, a set of photographs that he was commissioned to do during the BP Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. Now, this is 2010. I remember this happening. Um, I'm not sure if this was on your radar. This is, wow, it's already 10 years ago. It's incredible. But this was a really horrible um, traumatic oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this just one of the biggest oil spills in, in history. And this is a, a, a pretty clear example of the Anthropocene, of human activity, in this case, BP, British, British Petroleum, an oil company, taking something out of the ground that had been there for millions of years um, and releasing it into the water, which would not have been possible otherwise, barring like, who knows, like a, a meteor or something um, uh, coming down and then like, like creating this large crater where all this oil will come out. But, even that's probably not very likely. Our ability to extract fossil fuels um, and oil, which is an ancient material from organic matter that's decayed millions, year, millions of years ago, this time scale we have a hard time comprehending, that's definitely part of, of the Anthropocene. So there, there are, if, if you're interested in this, you can go, you can see videos. Uh, there was an actual camera underwater that showed you the, 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 the break and this oil just all spilling, spilling out into the Gulf of Mexico, um, and they were more or less powerless. They couldn't stop it. Um, so it was a really terrible environmental disaster, and Daniel Beltro was, was commissioned by Greenpeace to go and, and document it, and he was in some ways taken aback by how beautiful the images were. And this is one of those paradoxes about some ecological art. Like, this is a, an incredible photograph. It's kind of gorgeous. Even the oil itself, the oil rig, um, this is a ship, uh, and the oil on the water, um, which they had a heck of a time getting rid of. And in some instances, you know, it killed tons of birds, tons of fish, crustaceans. It completely disrupted the ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico, which it was already um, 
um, disrupted. But it's quite beautiful. So here's another one. Uh, they tried to burn off the oil. In some instances, you had companies that came in and they, they, they had this technology that, that, that sort of basically um, is supposed to take the oil and set it to the ground. Um, um, like it diffuses it down into the water. But then, of course, it's just the displacement, right? So there's still all sorts of issues with oil and contamination. So they tried to burn it off. So here's a video of trying to burn off the oil. This is almost like the, the, the incredible problem we have throughout the world now, but especially in, that, um, in the Pacific, the great garbage patch in the Pacific. Um, where we have so much plastic, and they still haven't figured out how in the world they're ever going to be able to clean it up because the scale is so massive. Um, we've created something, it's almost like a, a Frankenstein. We've created something um, that we then can't handle. We can't, we can't handle it. It's coming back um, and threatening us deeply. But again, these are really beautiful images. Um, here's another one. So a ship, this is the oil. So it's, it's catastrophic, but, but also very beautiful. Um, so in some ways, this is almost like landscape, uh, 19th century sublime landscape or something, where the sublime is this horrifying thing that's also in some ways beautiful and pleasurable. Um, the big difference, of course, is that in the, the discourse over the sublime in the 19th century and romanticism, the understanding was that you were safe. Like you saw this painting with this sublime landscape, um, like Caspar David Friedrich, and it looks like you're, you're, you're on this high mountain or something like that. So it's like you get this thrill, but secretly the thrill comes from being scared, but also knowing that you're safe, like you're in front of the painting. In the Anthropocene, um, we don't have that position. There is nothing outside the picture. We, I mean, it, it is with us, right? There is no, we have no distance anymore. We're breathing it in, we're ingesting it. Um, um, so it's, it's a much more scary version of, of the sublime because there's, there's, it's collapsed and we have no, no distance. Um, another artist who works in this way, you know, this, this, this way of, of representing climate disasters would be Mishka Henner. Um, and this is his Feedlot series. So at first you might not understand or see what it is um, until he shows you details. Uh, this is very high drone photography. Um, this is a large polluted lake. These are all little feedlots and every single little, you can't even see it from this scale actually. Uh, but you would have maybe, I don't know, 50 to 100 cattle in one of these feedlots. So this is large-scale animal agriculture. Um, that's what you're seeing. So here's another one. Um, so all these little dots, they're all cattle. These are huge, huge animals. Um, and all of this is a big pool of pollution, polluted, um, uh, polluted um, reservoir and, and blood. So there are all sorts of reasons why large-scale animal agriculture, and in some cases, a lot of cases, small-scale animal agriculture, um, is an environmental disaster. So one, awful, like they don't know where to put all this blood. Two, there's an incredible amount of pollution um, from these, um, 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 from this industry. And a lot of it, at least in the United States, goes down the Mississippi, basically because all these large um, concentrated feeding operations and, and, and um, factory farms and industrial feedlots, they're all lined in the American Midwest and all this pollution and all this runoff um, goes into the Mississippi and then down into the Gulf of Mexico. And we can now see that the Gulf of Mexico, because of this, has the biggest dead zone in the world, a dead zone in the water where nothing can live, right? On top of this, um, Animal agriculture, what he's showing you here, which again, it's quite beautiful. Um, it's, it's harrowing in the sense that uh, uh, this is so envir environmentally destructive. But these images are in some ways quite beautiful. Uh, I mean, even this one, even though this looks like a big open wound in the landscape, um, there is something quite uh, visually arresting about, about these photographs. Um, nonetheless, they do point to um, environmental disaster. And so one of the other um, um, really, really horrible consequences of large-scale animal agriculture, especially cab cattle, is the, is the release of methane, which is a more potent um, greenhouse gas than carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and animal agriculture as a whole is representative for, for uh, the second um, 
largest piece of the pie of greenhouse gas. So it's the second biggest emitter of greenhouse gases and driver of climate change. It allow, it's, it's a bigger driver of climate change than all the planes, all the cars um, um, on the road, all the buses. Um, the only thing that's bigger would be these large-scale fossil fuel industries that are burning that are burning oil. So animal agriculture, you may or may not have known this, um, is, 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 is uh, pretty devastating um, and the second biggest driver of, of climate change. And so Mishka Henner, through these very removed photographs, is showing you the scale of, of large-scale animal agriculture. And if you're interested in this, um, because I think it's still less well known, although people are starting to understand, um, especially with the, the, the coronavirus. Um, I've been reading so many um, good pieces documenting on how uh, this pandemic and all sorts, almost every other pan pandemic comes from zoonotic diseases, which come from d diseases of, of, uh, of, domesticating, of domesticating animals, right? So the Spanish flu, uh, bird flu, swine flu, all these things come from um, um, meat, meat operations and large-scale animal agriculture. And it really doesn't stop there. So um, I already said it's one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas. It's one of the, it's, it is the biggest um, contributor to deforestation. The Amazon, 90% uh, of deforestation in the Amazon is either for grazing cattle um, or from um, growing soy that then won't be fed to humans, but will be fed to that cattle. Um, we have the largest driver of species extinction comes from animal agriculture, so the sixth mass extinction that we're in, um, by and large, is from animal agriculture. Water use is insane. One hamburger is two months worth of showering. Um, so water use is, is crazy. Waste, I mean, think of it. We have, uh, every year, there's some like 54 billion land animals that are, that are killed um, in, 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 in the animal industry. Think how much cat, how many cattle that is. I read something that uh, if you dropped all all the humans into the oceans, the oceans wouldn't have a discernible rise. Like it wouldn't really make an effect. But if you dropped all the cows that we've bred um, in, into the ocean, the ocean would rise considerably. Like you would be able to see the rise. That's kind of crazy. That's how many more non-human animals there are, domesticated non-human animals there are, than human beings, and how much bigger they are. So their footprint is huge. And there are all sorts of other reasons why animal agriculture is, um, has become, or maybe always was, an environmental disaster. And I haven't even spoken about the ethical disaster, uh, or the ethical um, implications or questions surrounding the use of sentient, um, fellow sentient uh, beings. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, this, this graph actually comes from Cowspiracy, which is a pretty good documentary about the impact of animal agriculture. Um, and climate change. Of course, it's 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 a it, it's a, it has a lot of good information. Um, most of it is well researched um, from non-industry funded research. It is trying to entertain you, so you know it's not pure science, but it's still a good uh, it's a good primer. It's a good place to go. So check out Cowspiracy if you can. I think Netflix carries it. Okay, so now we move away from the representation of of environmental issues. And we go towards these artists who are actually trying to induce it directly into the audience. Uh, so Peter de Couperet, he's one of these, he's a Belgian artist. He's one of these artists who, who, who describes himself as an olfactory artist. So he works a lot with smells. So this is a smoke cloud installation from 2013, where you'd walk into the gallery and you'd see this ladder. And above the ladder is this beautiful cloud. Um, like he's actually created a cloud. It looks very, very real. Um, and you can actually get up on the ladder and put your head in the clouds, stick your head in the clouds, which is a nice, it's a, keep that saying in mind. You put your head in the clouds, and when you're in the clouds, he's, he's, uh, he spiked the clouds to have a certain smell, a smell of oil, a smell of pollution, a smell of uh, basically like the smell of, of greenhouse gases, of climate change. And so it's nice, this, if you put your head in the clouds, then you, you start uh, reeking of of, um, of uh, greenhouse gases. So it's this, it's this type of in installation that's trying to bring awareness, not simply through imagery, 
which may very well lead to uh, um, it may very well lead to action like this may very well lead someone to cut back on flying to cut back on their their fossil fuel footprint these works may may well uh, prod someone um, uh, to forsake animal products and, and go completely plant-based, uh, which as an individual is probably one of the biggest things that we can do um, uh, for, um, for climate change. Um, th uh, this may prod someone at a more, like, let's say, bodily level, right? Um, it's less abstract. You're not seeing an image. You're actually directly breathing it in and being affected by it, right? Um, same thing with Katie, uh, Katie Patterson's work. Um, this is a really interesting work where you walk into the gallery. It's totally blank except for this number. And it's actually a phone number. So this is a European phone number. Um, but you could call the number. And when you did call the number, um, you would hear the water of, of, of water dripping and melting. And then you would realize that you've called into um, audio sensors that she had placed on, uh, on an iceberg. Um, in the Arctic that is beginning to melt. Um, uh, this is one of the big reasons for rising sea levels is that um, increased temperature through glow, gr greenhouse gases like uh, carbon dioxide and methane is leading towards this massive melt off, which uh, it's, it's frightening, but it's happening faster than scientists even predicted. Um, so you, you can call in and then you actually hear um, this ice melting, in some cases permafrost melting. So this is this is a, like much more visceral. You're directly experiencing it. It's one thing to see a polar bear completely emaciated and melting ice all around him in a photograph. This was a very famous photograph from a year ago. It's another thing to actually hear it and kind of be there um, um, through through your through your cell phone. So this also is a work where it's trying to induce awareness of environmental issues, not simply through showing you, but actually making you um, experience it. And here's another example, Superflex, a Danish collective. They're really kind of fun. They're, they're wonderful. Um, they did a work for every single, every single few years, there's always these large climate conferences where all nations get together. So uh, one happened in Bangladesh in um, um, 2012, 2019. Um, another happened in uh, Rio in 2015. Um, one uh, is going to happen this year in Denmark. Hopefully, uh, people will actually be able to get together and hopefully, finally, some real action will happen um, on climate on an international level. Another is happening in 2025, and then one is happening in 2050. So they made a poster for each one. Um, and notice, each time it says uh, hypnosis group session. So what they do is they get certain people, uh, some participants, in this case there were five, so this one already happened. Um, should, yeah, Eagle. And they hypnotize the, particip uh, the participants to become these different animals. So in this case, the, the eagle. Um, in this case, the jellyfish. In this one, the polar bear. In this one, the mosquito. And in this one, the mammoth. So uh, there's something very cheeky and kind of playful about it. Um, trying to experience climate change from a non-human perspective. But it's also not just by chance that the animals they picked. So climate change is affecting these animals in very specific ways. Eagles, um, because of the, 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 the much, shorter, um, uh, much shorter winters, it's affected their, uh, their egg laying. Um, it's affected their, their migrations, uh, migration patterns and their, their, their ability to actually like have families and propagate, right? Um, jellyfish, on the other hand, are exploding. So it's, the climate change isn't bad for everybody. Clim uh, jellyfish really love these warmer waters and ocean acidification. Um, polar bears, of course, we know um, they're 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 doing uh, very very poorly, um, and we may not have polar bears by by um, you know in the next few by mid 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 century. Um, who knows? Uh, mosquitoes are doing very, very, very well in, in climate change, um, and they're they also they're very good at carrying diseases. There's an incredible article in the New York Times recently about the about the history of mosquitoes. There's some like uh, it, it it is by far our biggest predator. Like uh, it's killed off more humans than any any other animal um, in human history 
and by a long shot, right? So the, the mosquito, the very humble little 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 guy that, that annoys you and you can't really sleep, and then uh, you try to find it in your room to kill it. Um, it's actually on a global scale. It's been the most dangerous and lethal animal uh, because of its ability to, to carry disease. Disease, uh, uh, which um, will only accelerate with the proliferation of mosquitoes and with the, the warming of the planet. And then 2050, the mammoth, which of course is the poster child animal of extinction um, for, the, for the 2050. So there's something funny, cheeky, who knows what these hypnosis sessions are really like. Do people really, does the hypnosis really work? And then what does it mean um, to experience the world as a mosquito? Um, but it's also quite serious. Um, and it, it's a way of sort of prodding people to pay attention to these large climate change panel debates um, that, uh, that, that happen and so far have led to little action, I'm afraid. Um, now we move on to artists, and this is our last, our last, uh, last session, that in some ways their work is more activist and they're actually trying to have real world effects. Um, um, one example would be Alora and Calcidia, a really wonderful um, uh, collective. Of, these are two artists that are based in Puerto Rico. They've done so much wonderful work. And I, I definitely encourage um, to read up about them a little bit more. We would have talked about them if we, if we, uh, if we would have had a full semester, especially in the, the whole separate animals um, and lecture that, I'm, that I would have given as our last class. But this is one of their works that's representative of their type of practice. This is called Landmarks. And what they did, there were protesters in Puerto Rico on this island that I don't know how to pronounce. I'm sure many of you will. Many of you speak Spanish and you know it much better than me. Uh, Vieques, I'm not exactly sure if I'm saying that right. Um, an island in, in Puerto Rico that houses or did house a naval um, army base that would do a lot of military testing, bomb testing, which was which had deleterious effects on the ecosystem, on the Puerto Rican um, um, environment. And so you had these, these environmentalists that went in and broke in onto the island and protested. And what the, what the artists did, they created shoes that would leave these imprints, that would in some way um, either have images of resistance or texts that, that would resist um, the military presence of the United States and Puerto Rico and these um, environmentally damaging uh, military testing that, that, that happened on the island. And I don't know if it was a direct response to this, how much this helped, but only a year later that naval base shut down and moved out um, of Puerto Rico. So who knows? Maybe these footprints did have uh, did have an effect. Then we have someone like to Green, uh, Greenfort. He does really interesting work, very uh, environmentally active. This is a work he did for the Charger Biennial uh, Biennio in 2007, one of the first biennial that, as a theme, um, put ecology front and center. It was called Still Life, Art, Ecology, and the Politics of Change. And so he did a work called Exceeding Two Degrees, where he got a table. It was a, a, a table, um, like this very cheaply made table um, that he bought in the Emirates. This is where the Charger Biennial, Biennial happens, in the Middle East. And on top of the table, he put a thermo, um, um, a thermal device that would measure the temperature and the air quality of the museum. So that's the object, but the point of the work um, was more that he asked the, 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 the museum where the biennial was being housed to increase the temperature in the museum by two degrees. So it would be two degrees warmer. And it was very hard to do, actually. Um, so there's all this correspondence about how hard it was just to get this, the air conditioning to go up two degrees. Um, so, so that's also part of the work, the fact that these large-scale museums, which certainly don't have a small footprint, this is one of the big challenges going forward, is how, how do museums and large-scale exhibitions tackle environmental issues when they themselves usually have a very huge carbon uh, footprint, usually have a very big um, environmental impact. So that's a big challenge going forward. So he's thematizing this problem through this work. But he's going further. So the two degrees, you may know, um, especially in 2007, we're now on our way to well exceed two degrees. But scientists in around 2007 said two degrees is our threshold. Like we can't go above 
two more degrees Celsius warming. Um, after that, it's just going to be catastrophic. So that two degrees is um, poetic, or at least it references the climate politics of not going above this two degree um, um, uh, mark um, that was actually set by the Paris Agreement a little while back that unfortunately our country pulled out of. Um, and anyways, it was all non-binding. Um, so we really need to do better when it comes to binding agreements on, on the environment. So there's that. But then he also calculated how much money the museum would save, and he, and he made the institution donate that to um, um, an environmental organization that was, work, that was doing work in Ecuador, so halfway across the world. Um, and it was only a small little part of the rainforest over there that could be preserved. Like this is, this is a tiny, tiny in comparison to what we actually need for climate solutions. Um, but, th but this work is sort of, it's, it's a rich thematization of all these different things, of conservation, of air conditioning, of what, what it means to be in a museum, doing any ecological work, and of course the symbolism of the two, the two degrees. Then we have someone like Amy Balkin who's, who works in a similar uh, um, mode. This is public smog. It's a really arresting image. I really love this photograph. It's this, it's this, this, this I think is LA, if I have the right version of it. And you have this cube that's sort of been, imagine like just this, this cubic, uh, these, these cubic meters are taken out of the atmosphere. And that's a visualization of her having bought um, um, carbon offsets. So this is, this is one of the competing ideas of how to tackle climate change, is to have corporations buy carbon credits, um, which, will, which will then offset the carbon that they use when, when, when they're performing, um, when they're doing the things they do as a, as a, as a, as a polluting industry. Um, so leaving the politics of that aside, there are a lot of people that are quite skeptical of this, um, that this is too, still too market-driven, that we actually need something much stronger than this. Nonetheless, Amy Balkin then bought some of these credits, but then instead of actually using them, you know, a company would buy the credits so that they could release a cert that certain amount of carbon, she retired them. And so she calls this like a public park, a smog-free public park in the atmosphere. So her work has a lot to do with visualizing the atmosphere as this place, uh, as this political space um, where, where climate politics are unfolding. And she has another work which is really quite wonderful, which, and it's ongoing. She's trying to make the environment itself of the world um, a UNESCO heritage site. So if you, if you know what UNESCO heritage sites are, they're places that are designated, that they're untouchable. Like, um, and you have them lots of different places, like um, very famous vineyards in France that make like, some of the most incredible wine. They're so um, well known and so important that they've been deemed heritage sites, like all of Bordeaux is a heritage site. So it's highly regulated, right? And it's deemed to be something that needs to be conserved and protected. So it makes sense to think, oh yeah, the thing we need to actually live and survive, the environment, the, like the atmosphere, the, 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 um, the air we breathe, like of course that, that should be a heritage site. But she's had a very hard time um, <laughs> making it a heritage site because of course this would mean all industries that in some ways pollute into the atmosphere, large scale animal agriculture, um, uh, fossil fuel industries, um, air, the airlines, all of them would have to either curtail or just be made obsolete, like because they'd be polluting into a heritage site. So um, I think it won't come as a surprise to you that she, so far she has not been successful in making the air and the atmosphere of the planet a heritage site. And then let's finish. Um, let's finish with some 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 works of art that are maybe less poetic or less formal. Like these are still in some ways objects that have formal interest. Um, which isn't to say that these forms, these works don't have formal interest, but they're more within an activist mode. Um, so this is Liberate Tate. They did a lot of projects around Tate. This wonderful museum, um, um, or set of museums in London, which unfortunately, and I think still, but maybe not, I think they've divested since. They took a lot of money from fossil fuels, including Shell and BP. And so you had activists, Liberate Tate was one of them, who would go in and protest the fact that this cultural institution, which is supposed to be like the best of us, um, and, a, and a model for, for human society, was in fact 
uh, taking fossil fuel money and hadn't divested from fossil fuels. So similar things are happening um, with um, Occupy This Place and um, even at the university level of students protesting and trying to make their universities divest from fossil fuels. These, are, these fall into this type of protest. And so uh, they did all these, these really wonderful um, um, transgressive uh, performances. So one would be to, they actually came in with a piece of ice that they got from a scientist from the Arctic and they put it in the, in the tape and then let it melt. Um, another one is they had a performer at some point they snuck it in. Uh, the performer just totally gets naked, lies down on the ground in the fetal position and two other activists from the Bray Tape come and uh, pour, it wasn't actually oil, it was uh, like uh, sunflower oil that was, that was colored, um, and pour the oil over this human being. Um, all this as, as um, um, almost like as a flash mob kind of thing. This was not uh, a work that was sanctioned by, by the museum. So this is true uh, socially engaged protest, protest work. Um, and I think it's right. If I'm remembering right now that the, the tape did end up uh, disinvesting from from uh, fossil fuels. And then more, more recently you have groups like Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion which you may know of, you can actually be, be a part of um, uh, Extinction Rebellion. So they do a lot of different um, organizing um, and protests. The, 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 this comes out of um, England, um, out of London, had some pretty visible street protests. Um, coming out of a uh, Extinction Rebellion and doing all sorts of inventive um, um, and public works. So they're a group to check out. And then finally, um, I'm also a fan of the Laboratory of Insurrection, Insurrectionary Imagination. Um, this, these are only two of a number of artist activist groups that are, that are engaged on, on the issues of, of, of climate. Um, so again, I'm really only giving you two, but there are a lot more. So they, they do all sorts of what they call experiments, um, where they go out and do these very public works, one of which will actually be involved in pre-existing protests. Um, this happened in, the, in 2005, if I'm remembering correctly, the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army, where they all dressed up as clowns. And they went out um, to be part of protesters that were engaged, usually, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been part of a protest, um, I'm old enough that I, I remember being at Occupy in 2011. Sometimes these are confrontational and, and violent, um, the, the protesters and the police. Like, these can get very tense. Um, I've seen some, some, some tense, moment, tense moments. So their idea was to go in as clowns, and then they would sort of, their presence would sort of diffuse the situation. It would still be a protest, but in some ways they would kind of uh, make it more gentle, maybe make it more... More, more humorous, or at the very least, like mitigate whatever tension and antagonism could unfold over the course of the protest. So this is only one of the many, many experiments that, that they've done as a collective. Um, you, you almost think of it like all these separate tools that they use for social artistic experimentation in order to try to, you know, imagine a better, a better, a better world. Um, and then finally, they also have a place called um, uh, La Ronce, which is where they live um, in northern France. And this is part of their practice. Um, they, they created um, um, more or less a commune with, with a farm where they grow their own food, um, completely plant-based. Um, all of this is a form of, of activism, of climate activism. Um, and they use this as sort of a, a place to live and to launch and experiment all these these other um, experiments that they that they, that they use in um, in their climate activities as activists. There's a whole other section of artists working with uh, plants um, um, and 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 trees um, and greenery. Um, I wish I would have had time to, to show you more of these things, but uh, maybe at some point. Uh, city city will let me teach a whole class just on ecological ecological art, uh, but I think that's a pretty good um, introduction. So we'll leave it there. Um, thanks for the, um, the 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 nice semester. You you were all you seemed like such a lovely group. Um, I missed the fact that that we couldn't um, keep going in person, 
because of course it's so much better having um, dialogue and discussion. Um, but I wish you all well. Um, please stay healthy um, and uh, um, enjoy the onset of summer. So um, the next time I hear from you will be through the responses of this lecture and then I'll keep you updated about the final which will be exactly like the midterm which will be due in a couple weeks. Again, I'm going to be completely flexible. As long as I can get the grades in on time, um, I'm going to work with you. Um, and then you'll, you'll be, um, you'll, 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 be uh, you'll have a well-deserved rest over the summer, unless you're taking classes with me, which I welcome. Okay, everybody, take care.